Let's give you some food for thought. Last couple of days I've been watching a guy doing um, hangouts on Facebook because it appears that Facebook is the platform of the working people and not Twitter. Facebook. I, I dare say f Facebook is the one that, um, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who's been shadow banned on Facebook for years. As to where it's very rare that people actually see my um, posts on Facebook, even if they're friends of mine, even if they've like ticked the box, follow, whatever. It's rare they see my posts because it just you can go in it and it says you, your account's restricted. It's been restricted for years. I've uh, I've had every length of Facebook ban over and over again. I've been Facebook jailed as, as probably as much as uh, uh, I'm, I'm up there with the worst. I'm one of them people who's perpetually on the edge of the lifetime you're completely banned from Facebook. And I've been in that situation for, God knows, maybe eight years. So, but it's like um, Facebook is the platform that actually matters. That's the one the working class people seem to use as far as I'm concerned. Twitter, not so much so. Twitter's angrier. It's to do with its short form, isn't it? Twitter's angrier. Twitter is a rage platform, uh, which is why for many years I didn't use it at all. And in recent times I've been having a go at it. And the only reason I started it in the first place because there were certain people who I like to follow um, on social media who aren't on any other platform. They, they seem to think that is the place. So... I found myself joining in, going on Facebook. I think I've got something like 400 followers. No, not not for, not Facebook, sorry. Twitter, about 400 people follow me. As far as I'm concerned, it's 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 just a, it's a rage fest. It's, it's not a place where alliances are made. It's not a really that great a place for ideas being spread. And then you've got a matter of um, YouTube... The way that the algorithms run now, um, if you subscribe to somebody, dep well, it depends on the people who subscribe to you, how many people they subscribe to, whether your subscriptions get completely lost. So personally, I subscribe to so many people on YouTube that me, um, me subscriptions feed is meaningless. You have to dig through it to find stuff. So m more I find myself relying on the AI generated uh, home page that has taken notice of what I've watched previously and then provides me with more content that's similar. Although th there was a time when, because I, I, I'm, uh, I've been in opposition, that's why I get in so much trouble, I'm in opposition to um, uh, just rank wokeness by way of the LGBT thing as to where uh, f uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube's AI for a long time just thought I was gay and just and kept feeding me with more and more of it because I was in opposition to it so much they no one was reading it and AI was saying well this is what he watched so this is must be what he's interested in so I get myself absolutely bombarded with just pro gay stuff you see but I think it's become more nuanced I think the AI's improved and the use of it becoming more widespread and even cheaper to use because if you're just trying to um, uh, um, you know find a relevant link by way of oh this will sell some advertising space that's pretty cheap to power that's that's cheap use of AI that won't even cost a, a hundredth of a penny to generate that kind of thing that's the thing that AI can be frightening because what that chat GPT I, um, I've got a chap who uh, I, I communicate with him via Twitter because I used to communicate with people via Skype before but then I kept getting absolutely blasted and inundated by like um, whores but trying to sell me uh, trying to basically uh, sell me some kind of foreign marriage or else point me towards a cam show or something like that and got so many of them that things get lost on Skype it's just always new message request, new message request, new message request. 
There used to be a time when Skype had holes in it as to where people could hack you, they could find your IP address from Skype. And it, it kind of reminds me of that, so I'm, I stay away from Skype nowadays as well because of all the spam. You want to see my uh, my email inbox when you go to the, the spam folder? I must get 150 emails a day of just pure spam. Usually uh, scams. I think because in the past I've been free and easy with giving out my email address. Because when you do things on in, online, you end up using it because it's like it's, 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 it's linked to your PayPal, it's linked to everything. So once someone decides one day that they don't like you, they just start using your email. You just start using your uh, email address or else you start scalping email addresses. And then suddenly I, I get it where... It's like if you were to believe the stuff in my junk file. <laughs> uh, every day I have 10 failed parcel deliveries. Every day. Fake every, fake post office. Inundated with them. I've had some belting scam uh, emails before. It's, everyone gets them, but no, I don't think everyone goes in the junk folder just to say, oh, what the, what's the latest scam? There was someone who wrote me a letter, right? Or uh, wrote me a, it was were, it were just something where they, it was just a cut and paste letter to say that they'd hacked my webcam and had a film of me having sex. And they said, like, if you pay us, like, 10,000, we won't... Uh, put this uh, film out on social media. It's like, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible that they've got that kind of thing. It's like, no, you haven't got that kind of thing. But those who had, they might be frightened by that. If you were, and as well as that, it appeals to nutters that. It, it, it like, makes you feel frightened, but important. Which is the secret of actually scamming people. Is you have to make them afraid and also boost their ego at the same time that they're an important person and they'll fall for it. I see you trick somebody. You appeal to their narcissism. Scare them and make them feel important at the same time. This is how you, uh, you can destroy someone by like, with what used to be called the targeted individual scam. You used to hear that a lot on the internet. I'm being targeted, I'm being stalked, and it's like, no you're not, but someone's put the idea in your head that you might be, and this actually makes you feel better about yourself, like you're important at the same time as frightening you, and now you're running your mouth, and now you're running your mouth, whatever you were doing before that made you in some way effective as to where someone would target you, well you're not doing that anymore are you, what you're doing now is you're, you're screaming that you're a victim of some kind of conspiracy. It used to be the most effective way of nullifying somebody on the internet was the targeted individual scam. Right, try it. it a, lot, a lot of the time, it depends on who it is, because certain people, if they've got influence, they'll just call the cops and you'll get yourself in a hell of a lot of trouble straight away. But if you're nobody, no one's going to do anything to stop it. Nobody's going to do anything about it. If you try to do, to do it to your MP... He's going to call the cops on you and the cops are going to turn up. Easiest thing in the world. But you've got to identify that that person is a narcissist. To, to have an ego like that that needs to be inflated as to where they can't stop thinking about it. Doesn't work on me, I'm afraid. I find it funny when people attempt such uh, scams on me. I find it funny. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Like, uh, know something about this, seen this before. Doesn't work. The um, the clues that I haven't got that, ten those tendencies is sense of humour. And don't think, take things too seriously. Don't get so angry. I try to keep myself realistic and pragmatic and, and try and have a sense of humour about things. 
But, you know, the food for thought part. So Facebook is the platform for reaching out to people, for getting your message understood, and, and to actually get to local people. You never get to um, celebrities and influencers on Facebook. They don't engage, they're on Twitter. But, because that's where the action is, that's where the place is, that's where the numbers are. But if you want to create networks locally, you use Facebook. They're very, it's very effective. And I've been watching a guy who I'm, I actually met him, in, he made friends with me on Facebook because I met him in person a few weeks ago at one of George Galloway's meetings. He's, he's actually a sod, George Galloway. He told me to come to a meeting and I thought there'd only be three or four people there and I got there and there were like 500 people there. <laughs> he probably told everyone the same. I'm, I've called a meeting. <laughs> and everyone's there. So, there's a chap there I met, a Pakistani fellow with massive beard, massive chin beard. But this guy's from Bolton and um, Piers is a, an estate agent. And you would know him because he, he, he speaks in this broad Bolton accent. So he sounds a bit like Peter Kerr, like all people from Bolton do. And tend to have the same kind of sense of humour as Peter Kerr people from Bolton. Uh, there used to be a thing as to where, in my old job where I used to get around, people from Bolton didn't like Peter Kerr. And it's like, why? He's a sellout. He just stole all our jokes. He stole our sense of humour and he makes a load of money and we're all just as funny as him because we tell all the same jokes as he did. He does. But he's making millions and we're changing tyres for a living. So fuck Peter K. Bolton's funny like that. So he's, he's, he stole our act and then you get people, I remember him. It's like he's a, a little fat asshole. Ain't shit nobody. And you're like, okay, so you're not fans of Peter Kay from Bolton? No, we are not. He stole our act. But this lad from Bolton, he says he's got the Bolton sense of humour. And he made a really good point the other day. A really good point. And he's like, being an estate agent, he witnesses more in his way of putting it, misery and desperation than practically anyone else. You could be a nurse and you wouldn't witness the kind of shit he witnesses being an estate agent. And he made this point, he says, you know, if you're a single bloke or a single woman now, you're not married, which is a thing these days. People live on their own, don't they? It's part of why it's... it's it, with immigration, people living on their own is a reason why there's such a shortage in housing. Made the case before as to where divorce is a big driver of uh, house prices. Because that may, I'm in my way, I, I think like a proper economist like Thomas Sowell. So I, I juxtapose, uh, there's, there's things you can do with data sets like um, Look at the divorce rate and look at the average house, look at the house price, look at the average house price and just juxtapose them. And there is a relationship, there is a correlation. And there's many correlations you can make. Immigration's one and divorce is another where two households become one household that downsizes. So it eats into the number of starter homes, makes it more difficult for people to get on the housing ladder at the bottom. It's a big driver. And... Uh, Jack, he was called. He made the case that nowadays, if you're a single man or a woman, you need you need to be earning four hundred pound a week net coming out with just to pay for your rent and your bills. Four hundred quid a week, he reckons it costs now. Before you buy any food, before you plan to do anything, four hundred quid a week. And I'm like, well, in that, he's probably accounting for getting to work, transportation cost. And I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds about right to me. 400 quid. And if you assume these days what passes as a job, as a wage for the young, or just working class people, just school educated, haven't been to university, can't afford to go to university, don't have that kind of support, can't afford to get into student debt, 
another thing. Uh, those people need to earn £400 a week net before they can spend a penny on food. And I'm like, yeah, that's about right, isn't it? And what do the jobs pay? Well, most jobs these days are service jobs. So they pay minimum wage. And employers consider minimum wage to be good money. And this is another thing. If you were living with your parents, you could probably have a decent lifestyle on minimum wage. If you were only giving your mum £100 a week, which is probably high for paying your mum board. If you were just living with your mum and paying board, you'd have a, you could have a decent lifestyle on minimum wage. So it's like you get people who still live at home when they're 28 and 29. You should get people who still live at home when they're 40 now. I find that amazing. I left home when I was 18. I've always lived on my own. Because you could. You could afford to. You wouldn't have the beer money and the money to go on holidays and things like that living on your own. Like some of the, the rest of the kids on you at my age. They could go and do whatever they wanted. They could afford to have cars. They could afford to... Because they didn't pay a mortgage. They didn't pay rent. They didn't pay fuel bills. They just pay, paid a fixed rate every week. And also that fixed rate every week saw food on the table. So now it's like, this has crept, hasn't it? So we've got a large population of people who can't afford to live on their own or even can't afford to get married. And it's like, um, he was saying, it's like, if you're on what is minimum wage, working 40 hours a week, you'll, fight, you'll get that £400 a week or you'll be close to it. And the only way you can actually function without getting into debt is to have a partner that also works. And he was that you need a good, reliable wife. He's right in what he says. People might say, that's a bit sexy. No, it's not. It's realistic. You need a good, reliable wife who also works as well. Just so you can pay the bills and have a basic level of living. You know, you can afford to maybe go to the pictures or you maybe can afford to go to a football match or even a concert from time to time. You need two wages just to have a roof over your head on the sort of wages that people get. So like £400 a week, you know, it's... it's <laughs> where inflation's gone, once upon a time, 15 years ago on £400 a week, you'd be doing all right. I was earning £400 a week in 2010 and could afford all my bills and to go for a pint and to do more or less what I wanted it wasn't it was all right for me I was happy on 400 pound a week but now it buys about half of what 400 pound a week depending on what it is things like the internet cost about the same as it ever did but think try going out for a pint the L, in 2010 my local was selling pints of lager for 1 pound 45 Good old Sam Smith. Once you get a taste for it, it's good ale. One pound forty-five I'd pay for a pint of lager, and I, I could go out on a weeknight, couldn't afford it, and and spend a tenner in the pub and go home with a right good glow on. Now, if you wanted to go out and go and have yourself eight pints in any pub, you you it'd be it'd be your biggest expense of the week, wouldn't it? Think about council tax. Council tax where I live goes up 5% a year. A year, every year. 5% a year, every year. So now it's like 1150 quid a year to have your bins emptied. <sighs> Relates to a bill of ooh, 20, 23, 24 quid a week. Another proper big bill. But rent, oh my God, rent. I live in what you would term as social housing and have done for uh, I've done since I sold my house back in 2003. My social housing rent for a one bedroom flat is £107.50 a week and it's probably one of the cheapest rents. £107.50 a week. Now, this issue of stagnated wages and cost of living 
going through the roof. Like it wasn't so long before, because I'm I'm I don't believe in climate change and shit, but I'm I am, let's say, energy efficient. I always have been. It's just uh, you know I I know how to run things cheap. I don't waste things. I don't waste anything. I don't, you know, they give you they give you a, a bin separate for food waste. I never produce any food waste. It, I eat everything I cook. So there's no waste in my place, and there's no waste of electricity, and there's no exorbitant use of electricity. So my electricity bill used to be, five years ago, seven pound a week. Seven pound a week. And I'm not a big guy for... Um, um, I, had a, I was in a bath. I've got a shower now. Or just a shower room. But before I just had a bath. So I'd have a bath twice a week. So my gas bill was about £2.50. So I could pay for my utilities and, and just be breaking through a tenner a week. Now, my electricity is £18 a week. £18 a week my electricity and I haven't got anything else running that I didn't have before nothing apart from obviously I've got an electric shower now but I don't see how you should be stay in the shower for longer than 3 or 4 minutes so that's not really a big cost whereas when I used to have a bath I used to lie in it for 20 minutes half an hour sometimes So it's like, if it's costing me 18 a week, what about these people who are running elect, uh, like washing machines and things, dryers? I still say, I don't, I don't produce much washing. So it's like, I, I use half, of, I do half a load a week of washing, more or less. So my half a load a week of washing, I'd send it to my mother's and she does it. It takes, she just puts it in the machine and it's done. I very rarely need things ironing and things like that. So it's just a matter of throw it in the machine, pull it out of the machine. Done. So I don't actually pay for my washing. I don't pay for laundry. What about those who do? See, it, my, my amount of laundry is so small. Never be worth my while to uh, buy a washing machine. I just go to a laundrette. It'd be, it'd be more cost effective to just pay for one load of washing. I do one load of washing a fortnight. So yeah, I don't waste things. I don't I don't wear multiple outfits a day, which is a thing. Some people uh, go to work, wear the work gear, get home, and then you've got it where you, you turn up for work and you have to wear a shirt and tie every day. It's like, what's laundry cost you? Another expense? Cost of living is a real bastard and then the lack of disposable income is destroying all the uh, all the nice things the uh, the restaurants the um, the you know pubs things like that places people go to let off steam gone are just so expensive that to 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 use them become another pressure on your a real pressure on your expenses one thing i do get is letters addressed to previous tenants of this flat and i used to i used to put return to sender on them and, and put them back in the post box but it doesn't stop them coming once upon a time it did when you put not at this address return to sender and repost it it didn't come back but it doesn't seem to matter anymore because it's computers and computers don't read so i think the, the mail just gets thrown in the bin so every now and then when i see one that looks official that hasn't got my name on it i open it and have a look there's previous tenants of this flat that owe british gas like a thousand two hundred pound there's letters i get for non-payment of council tax that are well into the thousands and i'm like um how do you manage to run up such a bill? And I know how you run up such a bill. You prioritise your social life before your living. 
these people will not be skint. They've just let the they've let the life the lives have gone out of control because they didn't really understand. They don't really understand how to manage money properly. If you've lived on your own as long as me, you understand how to manage money properly, or else you're in the shit and you'll never have anything. I was terrible with money once when I was young. Now I'm not terrible with money. Now I, I I'm, I'm uh, again c conservative. Don't waste anything. Don't, don't, don't push the boat out and spend money that I can't afford to spend. Spending money you can't afford to spend makes you depressed. So it's like this kind of pressure. So the thing that undoes me is shocks. Shocks to my, my finances. Like something that you rely upon blows up and needs to be replaced. Your monitor blows up, your computer blows up, suddenly that's a shock to the system you didn't account for and then suddenly you've got a bill you can't pay. This is how people also end up in a lot of debt. Where then the pressure of the cost of living, big problem. We're fortunate in some ways as to where a decent computer now costs as much as a decent, in fact less than a decent computer cost 20 years ago. I mean, obviously, accounting for inflation, but a good computer in the year 2000 costs you a thousand pound. Good computer in uh, the year 2025 costs you about 400. You pay more now for the graphics card than the actual computer. You see how cheap SD, SD RAM, you know, solid state hard drives have become these days. If you don't know about it, find out about it. They use less power and they're miles faster. Get yourself a solid state hard drive. They're cheap as chips. That's right, yeah. You need 400 quid a week just to keep your lights on. What kind of life's that? Most people don't enjoy the work. They enjoy the time doing other things that work pays for more than work usually. You work a shit job, maybe you get to have a game of golf every week. Suddenly that means something to you, that's what you're working for. Can't afford that anymore, what are you left with? These are the concerns of everybody, every working class person. Whether you're a Pakistani, whether you're a Chinaman, whether you're of Jamaican heritage, whether you're from Scotland. These are the things that are pissing you off. These are problems that the, the poor, we can't absorb shocks like those who've got a couple of grand in the bank or else a rich relative or savings. I've never known what savings are, never had any. Most money I've ever had in banks about 1,500 quid. Most money ever. And it's like, I haven't worked in a, in a, in a, uh, in a sort of regular sense since the crash of 2009. When the big crash of 2009 come along, I remember making YouTube videos about it saying, this is the death knell for the working class this it's like the generation of kids who are leaving school now because I was of that I was of a I, I was someone who left school in the depths of a depression in like 1991 and nobody wanted to give you a job as a kid you ended up on some government scheme getting £29.50 a week being used as a skivvy and not learning a damn thing other than life sucks well is there a way out of this That's what's happened to people who were 16 in 2020, in 2009. They never had a chance. The wider world had scuppered them. And the way that education had gone them, uh, them days, they were mis-teaching kids. They weren't teaching them like science and engineering things at school anymore. You know, like things that give you a, a grounding as to where you can find that you've got an interest or a passion in something that's worth money. They weren't doing that no more. It's like they were grooming them all to be 
mu um, computerized musicians, sound engineers, graphic designers. It's like, you know, jobs like that, the first ones to disappear when people start to think about, um, yeah, we need to be cutting back, right? The guy who makes widgets for us, we need him, but we don't need that guy who designs posters for us so much, do we? Or maybe we only need him for half a day a week. Maybe we should just put him on price work. Maybe we should put him on a zero hours contract. Maybe he should go freelance and lose the security of knowing what he's going to be earning this week. You notice that, right? It's a thing that I've noticed a lot. People who found themselves in that gig economy, they, they're working under false names. Well, yeah, they, 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 they if you want to go on, because I've done it before, I've got, I've got an account on Uber Eats, but it's also an Uber account if I ever wanted to pay massively over the odds for transport. I've got an Uber, it's the same app. And also, at the same time, you can go on that and register to be a driver. Now, be the easiest thing in the world to register to be a driver for Uber. All you've got to do is to send them like a, um, a photograph of your driving license. But once that's been cleared up, you only need the phone, don't you, to get the work on. Just hand the phone to somebody else. And that's it. I'm pissed, actually, because, see... This is my phone, right? And my phone is, I'm bitter about it. It's like five years old and now it's, it's, it's a liability. It's like it lags and you answer a call and you swipe and it lags and the call gets cut off before you get time to time to answer it. So it's a real pain in the ass because it's like the kind of people who ring me are not easy to ring back. I get hospitals on the phone. I get doctors on the phone. They're not the easiest people to ring back, so it's a big problem. So I ordered myself a new phone. New phone, waited in for it yesterday from Amazon. And I've been checking the tracking data all day. And then it came, all right, your window of delivery is between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night. Right? And I got a dog who's as good as gold, but... He does kind of kick off when someone knocks at the door. He's good for it. And I don't mind it because, hey, it's like sometimes I've got my headphones on. I don't hear. So he answers, the, the dog answers the door for me. And between this seven and nine, I'm keeping a good eye out of the window as well, looking for this guy to come along. And then he gets to half past seven at night. I'm looking out for this guy. And then comes up on the website. We attempted to deliver your phone at 7.28 and there was nobody in. And the job had just been flung. They'd just been flung. So the website was asking me, saying, you don't live at this address. We need your correct details. I don't know what it is. I get Amazon drivers turn up at my house and be like, ooh, ooh. Uh, 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 the same postcode but they're two streets away from where they are to be and they had my phone number they didn't think of ringing me so it says you need to now go back on the website and you need to give us your proper delivery address I'm like that is my proper delivery address the guy didn't turn up he's turned up on the wrong street and then he, there's no way you can tell you can communicate that to Amazon no way they just keep demanding, no, you, you've, you've sent this to the wrong address. Give us the right address. And there's no way of dealing with it. So what do you end up doing? Cancel order. So it's a matter of, right, I'll have to cancel it because they won't attempt to re-deliver because they've decided I don't live in my own house. So then you get it. You now have to wait seven, five to seven days for us to issue you a refund. Well, oh, forget buying a phone then. Like I haven't just got an extra, new, I haven't just got another two hundred quid to spend on a phone. I have to wait to get me refund in order. Hey, thanks for that, Amazon. And it's a matter of your drivers 
are half assed people who don't fucking know what they're doing. And you can tell that. Do you know you can tell that? Have you seen the vans they turn up in and how many fucking dents they've got on them? Where they've just got off fuck it and scraped all down the side of the van. You look at how battered the vans are and it's a matter of... Yeah, um, no one can afford to do this job. The only way you could do, you could afford to do that job as well, working for Amazon. You hear of them, don't you, where they don't factor into the times how long it takes. You might need a piss, you know, and things like that. They don't factor in that you might have to stop or that you get hungry during the day and things like that. They don't factor that in. And these guys are working till 10 o'clock at night, but they're likely only getting paid till five. So you hear of a lot of misery from people who work at Amazon. So then it becomes a matter of who can afford to do this job. And it's simple to work out. Somebody who's already on benefits. If you're already on benefits, your rent's paid, your council tax is paid. And it's just pure spending money, isn't it, after that? So you, you, you could have a decent lifestyle if you're signing on at the same time as driving for Amazon and you're under a false name because you just somebody lent you their driving license and ID so you could apply online for the job. Wouldn't be so much of a thing at Amazon, but it would certainly be a thing with Hermes, Every, Yell, or all these, uh, these other uh, gig economy drivers. I've forever seen delivery drivers, clueless, even stuffing into things. So I got a post office van the other week, tried to do uh, uh, be going and lost and fuck it up and uh, try and attempt a J turn, you know, reversing into a reversing into a road to then drive out in the other direction. J turn, attempting a J turn and just taking out a road sign and fucking up the side of the van and just driving away as if nothing had happened. You get back to work and it'd be a matter of, oh, I've no idea how that happened. It's like, well, it's because you, you were lost and you were sweating. And you know that when, you, when, you, when you're driving around and you, you realise that you're lost and suddenly you start sweating and you suddenly have to turn the radio down. <laughs> you want a red alert. Well, that's what happened. And when you do that, suddenly you get frustrated and suddenly your driving goes to shit. That's why my phone didn't turn up. Some idiot who's following his sat-nav, saw something with his eyes. Right, there's a house around the corner from me. I live in a little block of flats that says like 18 to 24. There's a sign saying block 18 to 24. And just around the corner, there's another block on another street that says 18 to 24. But that road leads to my road. So they see that 18 to 24. And if they're not sharp, they think I live there. And they'll knock on the door and they'll say, well, I don't know what you're talking about because it's the wrong street altogether. Because I live on a street that you have to go up another street to get to. So you're clueless. I've had it, British Gas have done it to me twice. Last time British Gas comes around, I'm like, ring me for when you, I left, I left. Uh, instructions ring me because you will fuck this up because you fucked this up last time you came saying I weren't in and I was waiting in for you all day. So the guy says, don't know what you're on about, mate. And I'm like, just sit tight. I'll come and find you. And he's banging on the wrong house. Ah. Enough of me bleating about my problems with deliveries. See, it's a problem for me. I can't get out. I can't go out and buy. So I have to deliver things in. And they are absolutely useless. But you think if those guys were getting paid a living wage for that job, and they loved the job because they got paid well for it, and they weren't overworked, and they could take the time and take it easy and, and, and actually make a proper effort to do the job correctly actually ring the customer and say hey, I'm having some trouble finding you think that if they ring up you're going to say no fuck you I'm not helping you deliver me phone 
really. But that's the thing. They're earning pennies and the whole thing seems like a trauma to them. They don't like the shitty jobs they've got and the dirt poor. And then you wonder why the level of service these days is awful from practically everywhere you go. You wonder why they don't give a fuck. It's because they turn up for work to feel like prisoners because they're not going anywhere. That's a working class concern. Nothing worse than being a prisoner in your workplace, hating it. Understanding that I'm going nowhere here because by the time I've paid my bills, I'm not going to have a single fucking penny and all I've got to look forward to is the soaps or something. Coronation Street. <coughs> I've been there. I've worked in shit places. Worked in a factory once where the wages were so poor that you were just perpetually broke but you you didn't have to be per perpetually broke if you worked two hours overtime a day and you worked on saturday and sunday you got a wage you could live on so you work seven days a week to have a wage you could live on mm -hmm. working seven days a week isn't so bad but it, in your imagination it is you ate it it's like how do i escape from this when you get there and doing it, it's not so bad, but it's what it does to your imagination, it's what it does to your mind. Knowing that if you just do this, the contracted 39 hour week, you're not even going to have enough money to pay your bills. I've been in that situation in sales jobs too, where your basic wage is a joke and it's all about commission. And without that commission, you're not going to be able to make your, pay your bills. So it all then becomes about making money. And then it, with that added layer of pressure on you, you get this added layer of uh, disappointment and then also elation. So it, it sort of puts you into a depressive cycle. Mood swings. Go and watch movies like Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Salesman's movie. Every salesman in the world loves that movie. Why? Because that's just what it's like. You can be desperate knowing that you've got no money coming in, but you're still working five hours a week. And then suddenly something comes along and it's like, way! And then you start to kid yourself that you're good at what you do because something landed and you had nothing to do with it. It was just pure luck. It was just a matter of something came in. A number of people I know who've got reputations as being super salesmen. And they don't equate any luck to their success. They equate it all to skill. And it's a matter of, no, you've been lucky with the way that your accounts have fallen. You've had massive international conglomerate companies on your books that you didn't realise were massive conglomerate. And you thought you were actually skillful in developing this account. It's like, no, they're one of the biggest companies in the world, but you don't bother doing your research. It's like you were probably losing money on that account because you could have sold them so much more. But that's the thing. There's no incentive to do the job well when you're skinned. No incentive. Why be enthusiastic about something you fucking hate? It would come across as being insincere. It would come across as fake. Nobody likes fake. Sister does that. She runs a, a business. Decent business. She's been at it a while. She does all right for herself. And I, um, every now and then I go around and see her during the day. And she'll answer the phone and she'll put on this fake voice as to where she tries to sound a little bit posh on the phone. I'm saying, don't do that. Like, oh no, it's good manners. It's telephone manners. I'm like, don't do that. Why? Because it's condescending. It's fake. No one really likes fake. Speaking your Rochdale voice, people will understand you quite well. Have some character. Show some character. Putting on the false voice, that when the mask slips, you appear to be condescending and fake. Much in that way, where people talk like that, where they put the inflection at the end of the sentence. It's condescending. 
It's not professional. It doesn't sound good. It's condescending. Whenever I hear that from a politician, because you hear a lot from left-wing politicians, they're talking down to you. And it's not the proper way of using English. It's not the proper way of communicating effectively. If you know how to communicate effectively, you put your inflections or uh, make it, you know, make a word stand out naturally because you know what you're looking to communicate. But if you just put the inflection at the end, you you sound like you're being condescending. Remember a salesman, a saleswoman used to do it. Used to be a rep. Used to come in, and I'm like, I need to take the piss out of it. Because she did it all the time. And she was like a high flyer who worked for Compaq. Worked for Compaq. And I says, why do you do that thing with the inflection? It just makes you sound like you're condescending, like you're talking down to somebody. Like the, you're trying to, in essence, simplify it, but you're not doing. You're just being condescending. And she says, oh, that's because I'm from New Zealand. I'm like, does everybody talk there like that? Y yeah, they do. And it's like, you wonder why they ended up with the Jacinda Ardern as um, Prime Minister and, and worshipped her like a god. Oh, she's the greatest thing in the world. Can't bear it. What's that a reflection of? Misery. You, you, you're, not, you're not sure of yourself, so you have to mask You've, you lack enthusiasm. You hate what you do. So you wear a mask for work. It's like everywhere. Whenever you get a time of depression, high, low wages, high costs, it's like suddenly the productivity goes to shit. Why? People don't give a fuck. Because their enthusiasm wavers. They start to get mentally ill. They start to get depressed. They start to feel trapped. And it'd be a matter of, how long has this been going on for John? Where the, 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 the concerns of the working class have just been absolutely just thrown in the gutter. How long has this been going on? And I'm like, by my reckoning, about 18 years where working class people in... Uh, what would be you can say someone's in a dead end job but how many they used to say that dead end job nowadays you'd just be glad to have a job no one talks about oh I'm in a dead end job they don't talk like that once upon a time they did I know this is a dead end job and now you're kind of just happy to have a job and then you get it where you get people who are in dead end jobs and they get made up to being the supervisor over these other people who are in a dead end job and they're, they're likely earning an extra pound an hour and suddenly they're lauding it over people. I used to fucking hate that. So like eight, 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 not two weeks ago, you were a grunt like me and now you suddenly, you, you, you're kind of mocking me. That's good for morale. good for morale you find yourself trapped and that's what this 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 whole thing as to where it's now kicked off into violence it's because of that people feel as if they're trapped and there's no way out of it and they're desperate and they're not smart enough to understand who it is who's fucking with them and it's like Government have got a big part of playing this. The downward pressure on your wages that was caused by, in the first instance, all those bloody Polish people that they were making, getting rid of good jobs and just getting people in to do the same job but for a lot less money from Poland. I saw that first, like, with my own eyes going on in the 2000s. It's like, everybody who works in this place is Polish, aren't they? Yes. Everybody. Now, why is everybody Polish? It's like, well, it's cheaper. Uh, the previous guys were unionised and they were getting a decent wage on top of piecework. They were being paid for good productivity. But these guys, we can bring them in and put them on contracts and we only have to pay a minimum wage and we can make demands of them, which instead of incentivising them by paying them more to be productive, we can just say, if you don't do this number a day, you get the sack. And hey, 
we're getting the numbers because they don't want Saki. When that happened, a load of people who were earning decent money doing shit work but were motivated to do the work because they got paid well for it, just those jobs just disappeared from the world. Disappeared from the world. Repulsed, repulsed by pole, replaced by poles. Company I worked for, everyone who worked in the yards was fired and replaced with poles. And they used to, the poles, they were completely aware of what happened and what was going on. And they used to refer to each other as, excuse the use of the word, probably get me video in trouble, but I don't bother with monetization anywhere. They used to call each other the N-word. N-I-G-G-E-R, which is just the same as saying it. If you ask me, you know what I'm talking about. And it's like, why do you call each other N? It's just because that's who we are. We're the new ends. You couldn't afford ends anymore, so you got us instead. And it used to be a running joke amongst each other. And they used to, like, in their own way, you know that stereotypical lazy this is the thing about it. Yeah, I don't mean to be Ron Atkinson here, but a stere stereotypical, unmotivated, slave attitude to work. They adopted it and, 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 and used to bond over it. Like, you think I give a fuck about this job? You think I give a shit? Do you think I give a shit that you're having to wait two hours for me to, to valet this car so you can deliver it and you're standing around and not getting paid? You think I care? What about my lot in life? And you start talking to these guys and it's a matter of uh, the things that used to happen to those Pauls were atrocities. There used to be a guy who was a valetor. He was in charge of the valetors. He was in charge of the Pauls. And he spoke like six or seven languages. He was a really well-educated guy from Poland. But because he spoke Russian and Albanian, they put him on a lot more money and put him in charge. And it's like, yeah, I can communicate with the Albanians who are pretending to be Polish. Because they're not allowed in this country, but there's loads of them work here. Just borrow, go to Poland, borrow someone's ID, sign up for an agency and then get transportation to the UK laid on for them. This was why, a big reason why Brexit happened. This was a big part of the immigration question of back then, as to say, these Poles. It's like, by and large, they're decent lads, but they've just been wholesale hired through these dodgy agencies. I remember once when I were at Woolworths when the shop steward fought for one. He just, he was a good lad, the shop steward at, at, at Woolworths, and he, he fought for one where one had been told at 10 o'clock at night, right, you're back in at 6 o'clock in the morning, and this guy says, hey, I've been working since 6 this morning, I've done a double shift, well, you're back in tomorrow. No, I'll come back in at 2 o'clock, I'm knackered, I've just worked a double shift. And he says, fine, don't bother turning up. Shop steward overheard this agency overseer talk to the guy like that, and do you know what he did? There and then he took the whole shift out on strike. And he fought for him. What did the union guy do? He says, this guy's not getting any more, he won't get any more than about four hours sleep and you want him back on my shop floor, driving a truck. This is a health and safety risk to everybody who works here. I'm taking my members out on strike because you are threatening the health and safety. I'm like this. You do for me, lad. How long did he have to take his men out on strike to get that sorted out? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. But if he hadn't fought for the guy, he might have lost his job or else been actually a liability in a dangerous place that's the thing it's like they brought in all these foreign workers but they treated them like shit 
because they had a situation as to where the guys from Poland signed contracts of employment in Poland. If you break an employment contract in Poland, the, the penalties are pretty severe. Whereas if you break an employment contract in England, you can choose whether or not you ride on your CV as to whether they check your references to find out that you just walked. You've got the freedom to quit in this country. The Polish workers didn't have the freedom to quit. And when people complained about all that, them Polish workers, the way they were being treated and the fact that the job for everyone had been degraded by what they could get away with doing with them. They made it all about racist. They then conflated it with people who were coming from the third world. It's like, no, these are legal immigrants coming from Poland. You know, so in the last 10 years or so, because the Polish economy has actually improved, that you don't see hardly any Polish workers in this country now because it's not worth their while. But once upon a time, say Walker's Crisp Factory in Coventry, everybody who worked there were Polish ones. They used to be bust in. Bust in. Get off coaches at the bottom of the road from the factory and you'd see them all walking up in packs all wittering amongst each other not speaking a word of English. That degraded the working conditions for every like pleb job in the country. Degraded the working conditions for everybody. And drastically lowered the wages. Do you remember when once upon a time people who were heavy goods vehicle drivers used to earn a decent living because they had a lot of responsibility? Well, I saw that in my younger lifetime become a minimum wage job. Why? Well, they could just bring in a lot of Polish drivers who work for minimum wage. And I'm talking about when minimum wage was six pound or something. So guys who made themselves a decent life as heavy goods vehicle drivers, because like I say, it's a high responsibility job, were replaced by the lowest of the low rate workers. And suddenly you start having problems with corruption, things getting stolen, because the workers were that poor that the job becomes a license to steal. The reason why there's really no Woolworths anymore, do you know what it is? You know, Woolworths, the organisation I worked for a couple of times. I used to love working for Woolworths. Seriously. I used to enjoy the crack. Interesting work, always different, even though it was always the same. And uh, have a really good game of cards every break time. Enough for me. Great. I used to love working for them. You know that place went under because of incredible amounts of shrinkage, thieving. Like incredible amounts of it. Do you know where that stemmed from? Forces of security guards at the, inst at the um, distribution centres being paid £2 an hour. Now if you're on £2 an hour and you're booking out Thousands of quid's worth of merchandise in trucks. And criminals inside the organisation say, would you like to earn yourself an extra £400 a week? When my, when my shipment comes through, and we'll give you the tip, um, you just sign it off, knowing that it's not actually going to where we're saying it's going. Every now and then there'll be a truck with a trailer comes through and it's been booked into the garage. It says that it's going to the garage for repairs, but it's not. It's going to an abandoned car park where we're going to lower a uh, forklift truck off the back and unload it into our cars and then take it and then hawk the goods in the local pubs and clubs. And here's your cut. What do you think you're going to say to that? And then when it becomes so massive uh, and people become so sort of leveraged where knowing about it then becomes the reason why you don't talk about it because it's so big and no one can actually face it as to where everyone in the place knows that there's a, a cartel that's robbing the place blind every week. But no one's going to talk about it. Why? Because 
you would risk putting all your mates out of work. So it's in essence, everybody who knew about it was in essence signed a, a deal with the devil and no one was willing to blow the whistle even though everybody knew about it. Poisoned the culture in the place. And then the next thing you know, oh, no good jobs there anymore. Everyone gets replaced with Polish agency staff. Uh, not taking anyone on anymore. Everybody on short-term contracts as the place is losing so much money they need to cut back. And what do they cut back on? Wages, benefits for employees, where criminality brought it down. <coughs> criminality destroys everything worth having. Destroys jobs, destroys towns, destroys environments. Criminality. And it's a matter of, well, if you treat people like criminals and take away their reasons to be enthusiastic, they tend to start behaving like criminals. I'm just saying. 